So what we're going to talk about today, folks, is fetal stem cells. This is um, a culmination. This lecture is a culmination of the last about 10 years of my life. It's an aspect of stem cell therapy that is widely unknown, uh, not only to the general public, but even the so-called stem cell experts. And uh, I've spent the last 10 years of my life not only following it, but also participating in it. You will see me in this lecture getting the therapy myself. I've had it eight times myself. My whole family has had it, et cetera. Um, he did a very good job of introducing me, but um, this is me. You can find me on IMDb. I've been making documentaries for about 15 years. I've done seven documentaries, starting with Brzezinski. I'm not going to go into every detail, but what I want to say is I s was introduced to fetal stem cells around 2014 when I was working on Seconds Opinion, Laetrile at Sloan Kettering. And um, I've been kind of slowly working on this film ever since. I did release my first fetal stem cell movie called The God Cells in 2017, but um, this new one, Ukraine Fetal Stem Cell Pioneers, is sort of my magnum opus of this, <laughs> of this subject matter, basically. And what I'm going to go through today with you is essentially the equivalent of a director's commentary on this documentary, but I'm including a lot of extras that are not in the documentary as well. Um, so I'm not a medical professional, not a, not a scientist, but a lot of people that are in the fetal stem cell field that are experts have kind of uh, proclaimed me to be as knowledgeable as, you know, as they are, frankly, without having the degree. This is the documentary that we're going to kind of go through a director's commentary for. You can find this for free on YouTube, Apple TV, Tubi. You could pay money for it on Amazon if you choose. But I think it would be very important for you to uh, see this documentary if you have not already after this lecture, if you really are interested in the subject matter I'm going to present to you. Um, there's a reason I'm showing you this, okay? This is the horse and carriage, as we know. Um, when you're talking about stem cells today, the majority of stem cell clinics and labs are dealing with the equivalent of this in regards to technology. Now, with this technology, we're talking about transportation. And when the horse and carriage was introduced, it was certainly an exciting form of transportation. But something else happened after the horse and carriage was invented, and that was this thing, the automobile, the very first automobile. And so in the time of the horse and carriage, we had a host of horse and carriage experts, people that built the horse and carriages, people that drove the horse and carriages, and people that repaired the horse and carriages were all horse and carriage experts. And then along comes this automobile, and the horse and carriage experts say, wow, beautiful carriage, where do you connect the horse? And of course, the automobile maker says, oh, no, no, we don't connect a horse to this carriage. This carriage is an automobile. It runs on something called an engine, and it's fueled by a liquid called fuel. It runs itself. No need for a horse. Long pause, three, two, one. The horse and carriage expert next asks, okay, great, where do you connect the horse? It was a very confusing time uh, for this transition, and what I'm trying to illustrate by showing you these two images is that currently, by and large, not to poo-poo on the stem cell community at large or the so-called stem cell experts out there, but when you're watching a TED Talk on stem cells, if you're watching a lecture on YouTube outside of this lecture or purchase any of the books you find on Amazon on stem cells, they're essentially talking about these two things. And then along comes something that far outshines these two pieces of technology, such as this which is essentially a metaphor for what we're talking about today. So the people that are experts in these two things see this and their eyes crossed and they get very confused. And I'm gonna use the transportation metaphor today on multiple occasions. And the reason for this is I've found in 10 years of researching this and sharing this information that comparing stem cell types to say transportation types is a very useful metaphor. Here's an example. Let's say you call up your travel agent and you say, hey, I need transportation from New York City to Los Angeles. How much do you charge? $500, they say. Oh, I'm gonna call somebody else, get something cheaper. Hey, I wanna go from New York City to Los Angeles. What kind of transportation do you charge? $50, ah, I'll take yours. But little does the person know who's asking for this transportation, they don't know what type of transportation they are ordering. So the guy selling the transportation for $50 is selling a bicycle. The guy selling the transportation for $500 might be selling an airplane ticket. 
And so I'm using this metaphor because a lot of people say, I got stem cells, my aunt got stem cells. And my next question is, well, what kind of stem cells did you receive? And the question inevitably is always, I don't know. Today's lecture is about fetal stem cells. And my hope is when you're done watching this, and by the way, if you're just listening to this, you're not gonna get the most of this uh, lecture. You're gonna need to watch this or watch it more than once. So fetal stem cells are, are simply the most powerful form of stem cell therapy to date. No other stem cell type can compete with fetal stem cells. Why? Because no other stem cell type available to you contains organ-specific stem cells. And this is gonna be the goal of today's lecture. I wanted to start with that and express today's goal to hope that you walk away with the same conclusion. This is simply my email and my uh, main website. All the buttons on the left is how you watch all my movies for free. I'm gonna show this again at the end, but a lot of people that see my documentary love to email me with follow-up questions, and I encourage you to do the same. Uh, this is simply the website for the documentary. There's the two buttons above it, the YouTube channel, as well as the button to watch the movie. Again, available for free to check out online. This is the title of the movie once again. So here is something that is a big caveat to this entire lecture. There is only one country on planet Earth that this stem cell is legal, regulated, and available, and that is Ukraine. And especially what's going on today, you might want to stop the video now and say, well, if it's in Ukraine, I'm not going to be able to get this. What difference does it make? Completely untrue. And I think at the very least, if you spend the time to finish this lecture presentation with me, you will see uh, why uh, you know, Ukraine is not unobtainable. Not today and not tomorrow. And because Ukraine is the only country on earth where this is legal and regulated, it, it begs to reason that, well, Ukraine is the only country on earth that this therapy can be obtained. And I'm going to drive this home a few times today because I can't tell you how many people have seen my documentary and watched it and emailed me and said, Eric, amazing, I want this therapy. I want my aunt to have it, I want my mother to have it. I'm not going to Ukraine, where else can I go? And what's gonna be my answer? This answer, because it's simply only available there. And I'll explain why. This guy, is the reason why this therapy, one of the reasons why this therapy even exists. This is a German pathologist named George Schmorl. In the eight, late 1800s, he was the first person to document the discovery that during ma the maternal process, during the time when the mother host, the female, has, is going through the fetal development with a fetus in the womb, something happens during this process, and that is the fetal cells migrate into the maternal body. This has been known for a century. He was the first person to bring it up, is why I want to bring it up. And he's also, I point this out in the movie, and he noticed back then that these fetal cells that leave the womb and go into the maternal host slash mother have stem cell-like properties. Now fast forward, ubiquitously through the medical literature, it is no contest, this everyone has agreed and realized that wow, Here's a Scientific American article. Scientists discover that children's cells are living in mother's brains. And that, by the way, this is years after uh, people have given birth to children. And the reason they know this, you might say, how could they know that? Well, if a female, being a mother, gives birth to a male, being a man, um, they found male chromosomes, not only in the brains, but hearts and other organs of women who donated their bodies to science after they passed away. And that is how this discovery was made. And it's, it's not an arguable discovery. It's filled, the literature is filled with it, which led to this invention. Here's another article. New studies have shown cells from fetus end up in mother's brains and hearts. Mothers that have dealt with some brain issues, they've been repaired during pregnancy. It's a much more milder form than the therapy itself. Women with congenital heart defects have been repaired during pregnancy. This is a verifiable reality. I've even had people watch my movie and say, you know, it was interesting. I have multiple sclerosis, and I, during my pregnancy, I noticed a regression of multiple sclerosis during pregnancy. Why? Because the fetal cells were migrating out of the womb, crossing the blood-brain barrier, and protecting the mother host. And if you think about it from a mother nature standpoint, it would make logical mother nature sense for both organisms to protect one another. It's all through the peer-reviewed literature. Peer, fetal stem cells migrate into the mother during pregnancy and in the humans can persist for decades long after the, uh, the mother host has given birth. Fetal cells also appear to target sites of injury. 
crossing both the placental and the blood-brain barriers, crossing out of the womb, into the bloodstream, and into the brain itself. Now, scientists have seen this, noted this, and a small group of scientists said, hmm, I wonder if there's a way to harness this. After all, we are living in a world where tens of millions of fetuses are aborted on an annual basis. They're thrown right into the garbage after abortion. What if we were able to harness this? But more importantly, who on earth will ever allow us to even do such a thing? And also, this another point that also confuses many of the experts and confused them at first. What's interesting about the fetus is it indeed does have different genes than the mom. For example, if a woman, mother, gives birth to a son or daughter, that son or daughter grows up, the mother ends up with kidney disease, needs a kidney transplant, asks one of the children first, hey, can I please have one of your kidneys to save my life? The child goes, gets the genes tested, goes, sorry, mom, my kidney isn't a match. Why? Because the fetus has different genes than the mom. So one of the arguments is often, well, gee, Eric, if this is a therapy, the body's just going to reject it. It's different DNA, different genes. Not true. The fetus has different genes than the mom. Therefore, the DNA being injected into you is different DNA than the patient. I'm going to show this list of cells to you many times today because this is something else, like Ukraine being the only place on earth this can be acquired, that the average person has a difficult time absorbing in my 10 years of researching this and presenting this information. Look at this list of cells. Look very carefully at this list of cells. Notice the organ systems they come from. In the documentary, I didn't list the actual organ, but for today's purposes, I'm listing the organ of origin for each of the stem cell types that not only I, but every single patient that walks into the door of this clinic I'm gonna to present to you in Ukraine receives, regardless of their diagnosis, okay? There's a reason why as of 1991 on the left is at the top, the hepatic and the hemiopoietic stem cells from the liver, that's where they started and I'll explain why, to expanding upon every major organ system of the fetus transformed into a therapy, a stem cell therapy, and placed inside of a human being through various forms of injection today. This is the clinic, the only clinic on planet Earth at this time that not only is a laboratory, but also a full-blown clinic that has been in operation for 30 years that is on a routine basis accepting fetal material, extracting the fetal material, separating the stem cell types out, testing them for bi viral and bacterial contamination, testing them for viability, storing them cryo uh, preservation, and giving them to human beings. This is a state-of-the-art facility I'll show you more of. Looks like something out of Silicon Valley, to be, if you ask me. Now, this company did not start this way. They started very, very small, and the original founders of this company were experimenting in animals. They had been done it, doing it for years. They had not been given permission yet to start in human beings, not until a very dramatic event occurred. And so something happened. Like a lot of big tragedies in human history, new innovations are uh, spawned from huge tragedies. And so what happened was, in 1986, as most people are familiar with what happened with Chernobyl, a massive, devastating accident occurred in Chernobyl, which occurred just north of Kiev, Ukraine, where this clinic is located, in Kiev, Ukraine, in what was once Soviet-controlled Ukraine, before they became independent. As we know, this was a horrible accident. There's been documentaries made about this. There's been dramatized series made about this. Most people are familiar with how devastating this nuclear accident was. And one of the worst things that happened to people was what? Radiation-induced aplastic anemia, otherwise known as bone mar marrow failure. This is what most people were dying of. The radiation sickness, otherwise aplastic anemia, was killing people's bone marrow. People were dying left and right from bone marrow failure after Chernobyl. And what is the cure for bone marrow failure right now, today? Even today, the only treatment or possible cure for this is a bone marrow transplant, which, for those who are not familiar, first of all, by the way, bone marrow transplant is the first ever stem cell transplant in human history that we're aware of. It's the first stem cell transplant ever created. And secondly, a bone marrow transplant is 
quite expensive and quite labor intensive. It goes in the range of eh, half a million dollars per transplant, give or take $100,000. And you need to have a, another adult that matches the patient or victim's bone marrow that matches it. And then they have to take the victim slash patient who is suffering from radiation uh, induced bone marrow failure, lower their immune system to the edge of death to make sure that the patient slash victim doesn't reject the bone marrow transplant. This was the only option for these victims of Chernobyl back in the 80s. But something was being observed at the same time. The Los Angeles Times is the only piece of news media I could find that covered this. May 16th, 1986, Los Angeles Times reports, more Chernobyl deaths called unavoidable, but Los Angeles-based doctor says that a United States slash Soviet team may save many of the most ill. And the most ill are those dying of um, radiation-induced bone marrow failure or a plastic anemia. Now pay attention to this for a minute. The U.S.-based team only was observing. The Soviet-based team contained the two original founders of M-cell. And these two original founders had realized in animal studies and understood that at the end of first trimester, between 7 to 11 weeks, the fetal liver cells were the foundation of the soon to be developed bone marrow system of the fetus and thus adult. And they just said, looked at each other and said, what if we try to introduce fetal liver cells into a people dying of bone marrow failure? Hey, let's see if it, if it works. We have no idea. Let's give it a shot. And sure enough, okay, well, here's an expansion on this. A major problem that confronted the physicians on the first frantic days was to find suitable bone marrow donors. So not only were people dropping dead left and right of bone marrow failure, but their bone marrows were so destroyed that finding an even a sample good enough to find a match, aside from the franticness of the situation and the labor intensive nature of setting up one bone marrow transplant after another was seemingly impossible. And all of these people were living in hospitals, living off of blood transfusions, waiting and hopeful for a bone marrow transplant. But the two founders of M-Cell, a part of that Soviet team, started using fetal liver cells as substitutes for adult bone marrow. They did not know if it was going to work. No one knew if it was going to work. It had never been tested in human beings ever up until testing it on people who were going to die anyway due to Chernobyl. This is one of the living co-founders of M-Cell. I spent a great deal of time with this individual. He was one of the uh, people, a part of the Soviet team on the ground after Chernobyl and injecting fetal liver cells end of first trimester into radiation-induced bone marrow failure patients. This is both of them. The one on the left behind the desk, he has since passed away. But the two men you are looking at are the two original founding pioneers worldwide of fetal stem cell therapy as we know it. And again, they had studied what George Schmoyle observed. They had studied the peer-reviewed data for decades and decades, noticing how the maternal body and the fetus interacted with one another and how these non-genetically matched cells left the womb and would circulate throughout the mother host, the maternal host, and not only be there for the rest of the mother host's life, but repair damage in the mother host. And they thought, as any reasonable scientist would, hmm, what if we turn this into a therapy? And they had been experimenting with animals for many, many years up until the Chernobyl event, until Chernobyl allowed them the opportunity, swung open the door to allow them to test this in people. See this guy on the right? That's Dimitro. He's a very healthy, grown adult with his young child and his beautiful wife on the left. This person you were looking at is the very first human being in the history of humanity who has ever been treated with fetal stem cells. He was laying in a hospital bed, about the same age as his child is there in the picture on the left, living off of blood transfusions, certainly after Chernobyl. The two individuals that you saw approached his parents and said, hey, we would like to experiment and inject something into your child that may or may not pull him out of bone marrow failure. Two rounds of injections taken done over a two week period completely cured Dimitro of bone marrow failure. Now you would think this guy would be on the cover of Time and Newsweek, but that's another conversation. You would think Nobel Prizes would be flying around. That's another conversation, but this happened and he's not the only one. It happened to many and it went completely under the radar. 
and to prove that this guy is still alive, I spoke to him. Here I am with Alexi, uh, one of the co-founders, uh, on Skype talking to the guy when I was filming the God Cells. I even spoke to his parents on Zoom. It all had to be translated because they didn't speak very good English. But what's kind of amusing about this meeting was the parents and the patient had no idea what was actually given at the time. The parents were just so darn happy that their kid is, was saved and is still alive today with his own family. And it wasn't until this moment that did the patient or the parents even really understand that they were given fetal liver cells. Anyway, this is all in the God cells, and I bring this back in Ukraine Fetal Stem Cell Pioneers. But understanding the history of this science, I think, is very important. It started out where the, the founders understood the premise, but if it wasn't for this awful event, did they have an opportunity to put it into action? And the reason I showed you that list earlier, as of 1991, because of 1991 is when they officially opened their doors, and they were only using fetal liver cells on new patients for other reasons, not just, say, bone marrow failure. Here he is again. I spent a great deal of time with him. This is one of the first ever fetal stem cell transplantologists who's still alive in Kiev, Ukraine right now. Um, this is just a screenshot from my documentary. This is the building, MCEL, Kiev, Ukraine. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because I'm going to get into the behind the scenes of how this works. Now, I could parade around every patient under the sun of every patient I've met that's done really well, and I'll do some of that before this lecture is over. But I think in order for you to appreciate the magnitude of what I'm showing you, if you don't understand the basic science and the basic premise behind this, I feel like it won't be as impactful as um, it's in my opinion. I think just, just bear with me to see what goes on under the hood here to fully appreciate the magnitude of what's happening here. So here's the building. The top floor of this building where it's yellow, that is a brand new state-of-the-art biotech fetal stem cell production laboratory. Everything below that is all clinic rooms. And I'll repeat again, this is the only lab and clinic like it on planet Earth. It doesn't exist anywhere else. No one's tried. Some people have tried, actually, and failed miserably because nobody has been able to master the art form of this like the Ukrainians. Inside that lab, um, I was let in. And by the way, I am the only one that is like an outside person, quote unquote, that has ever been let into this lab. And this took months of convincing. This was not an easy task. They did not trust me out of the gate uh, for a million reasons, as you can imagine. But what I'm going to show you is essentially me being the first person ever allowed behind the scenes. I had to uh, get in the scrubs and, you know, like, ev like, a certain, like a, every other lab tech there. So my wife and I were together uh, producing this. So, you know, I'm gonna show you basically the, uh, the uh, process of the extraction, the testing, and the preserving of this, and also the proliferation side of this. Just bear with me. So this is just, they wouldn't allow me inside beyond this glass for sterility reasons. Frankly, I would have contaminated everything. These, the level of sterility and the whole, every room is climate controlled. This is a state of the art lab, um, you know, as any other high end biotech lab should be. Obviously, you know, there's a, a gigantic cryopreservation side of it all. I'm just kind of giving you a preview at the moment. And they also, you know, check for the viability of these cells using special equipment as well as the good old fashioned naked eye. I could walk you through all of this as well. Another interesting point about this new lab, this new lab, um, by the way, they were in multiple buildings. This new lab is not the only lab they've been in. This new lab was completed at the end of 2019, um, which also, again, includes the uh, new clinics. It's a lab and clinic, all in the same facility. This lab, uh, they took five years to complete. It is what is called up to good manufacturing practice standards. This is simply a Food and Drug Administration explanation of what that is. Any high-end biotech firm anywhere in the world, or lab, excuse me, uh, pretty much has one of these. And so what this does is it basically theoretically qualifies MCEL to, to the first stage of submitting to FDA approval. Now, for reasons that are not we don't have time for today this is never going to be allowed through fda approval process even in the early stages first of all because the abortion issue is so um, contentious and second of all quite frankly it'll put the entire chemical-based pharmaceutical industry completely out of business that is a whole separate lecture but the point is is that they have hired outside european consultants to oversee the manufacturing of this lab to make sure it is up to the highest standards based on what is the highest global standard, and that is called good manufacturing practice. 
This is another shot from the inside. Um, this is just simply monitors in the background monitoring each room of the lab. Each still that I'm showing you is essentially taken from the documentary. I do use a lot of subtitles in the documentary. While they speak decent English, I subtitle a lot of it. And this is simply a portion of the movie where they explain, and we are the only one in the world which produce the fetal stem cell preparations. Now, M-Cell is the only laboratory and clinic in the world that produces fetal stem cell cells for routine medical use, medical therapy. There are a handful of labs around the world taking a little bit of fetal tissue here, a little bit of fetal tissue there. Some of them are in FDA clinical trials in the United States, but you have to understand the difference. The Americans are generally taking 20-year-old frozen brain cells that have been sitting in cryopreservation for some two decades, taking a piece of it, expanding it in the lab, and testing it in mice and human beings. That's the extent of it. And if you saw that long list, if you remember the long list, that is much different than throwing the kitchen sink at the patient, which is essentially every major organ system. So while you might say, Eric, they are doing this you know, in the United States in some degree, and other, no, not like this. They're not doing it like this. Now here's the elephant in the room, folks. This is what most of you are scratching your head going, Eric, the abortion issue. Are you telling me that you need an aborted fetus uh, to have this therapy? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. But guess what? There is an estimated, this is World Health Organization statistics, look it up, 40 to 50 million abortions performed annually worldwide, virtually all of which are discarded as biological waste, with a minute fraction of this fetal material being donated locally to M-Cell's laboratory with the express rented consent of each donor. And I'm going to do this right here while we're sitting here live. I'm going to pull out my calculator. Let's take the low end. 40 million abortions every year divided by 365 days. That's nearly 110,000 aborted fetuses every single day in the world. Divide that by 24 hours. That is 4,500 fetuses on the low end every hour aborted every single day, every hour. So in the two hours you're going to sit here listening to me, nearly 10,000 fetuses will be aborted. And the reason I drive this home is because the first reaction, especially to someone who does not believe that abortion should be legal, and I'm not here to argue with anyone about their beliefs. Everyone is free to believe what they wish. I am simply stating the facts as they stand. And the fact that we have such an overabundance of abortions does not encourage anyone to have an abortion on purpose, much less the absurdity of being paid to get pregnant to have an abortion. And the most important part about this is also is the term donated locally. As you will learn in a minute, this material ideally needs to arrive at M-Cell's lab within one hour of being uh, of the abortion procedure. So the idea of, say, a bunch of Americans and Russians and Chinese and Japanese and Europeans getting pregnant on purpose and shipping their fetuses to Kiev, which I've heard this question, is asinine because it's impossible because you need it around an hour to get it there. So whatever is donated locally within an hour drive of the M-Cell laboratory is all they use. Just try to do the math on that. 5,000 fetuses an hour worldwide, how many do you think that's going to be locally? The target time, this is a really important uh, point to nail home. They don't just take any aborted piece of fetal material at any point of the gestation. The end of first trimester, between seven to 11 week, is the ideal time to find and to harness this material. And I'll explain why, but I'm gonna give a general reason why right now. Anything younger than seven weeks is too immature. There has not been enough organs, specific cells formed yet. And if you have something that's too immature, then you might end up growing something that is not intended, like say a tumor. But if you have something that is just mature enough, that has the organ specific tissue already formed, yet doesn't have a DNA rejection, which happens to be in the seven to 11 week, that is what they're looking for. Anything beyond becomes too mature and you do risk the possibility of rejection. This seven to 11 week window was basically um, discovered during the animal testing phase and which was further supported when they started giving it to humans. I'm gonna show this again. 
Here is the full list of cells that every single patient run, walks in the front door that gets this therapy receives. As of 1991, they started with the liver cells. And since then, they slowly expanded the portfolio, if you would, of the different types of cells given to each patient. Here is two of the scientists working for M-Cell. Their work starts from the, now I'm gonna walk you through, I'm not gonna show you graphic detail, of course, but I'm gonna walk you through how this process is done, because I think it's important to understand this aspect of it before you can fully appreciate the end result of this. Their work starts from the moment that the fetal material is donated to them. The hospital gives them the fetuses, they transport it here, ideally within an hour, and they act immediately. They don't say, yeah, I'll get to that in a couple of hours. Oh, no, no. They are notified when it's happening, when it's on its way, and when it arrives. It comes in the door. Stage one. There's four stages of the basic process. Fetal material arrivals, arrives. They take its temperature. They log it with a specific log number so they know what batch is what. Um, and it goes right into the extraction phase. What you're seeing is one of two doors. The fetal material goes in door number one. It enters a climate-controlled capsule. Door number two is opened after the, uh, the air is sterilized and cleaned and into the extraction phase it goes, it goes. You have one technician on the right that prepares the fetal material and hands it to the scientific technician on the left that actually points out and pulls out the organ-specific cells. And then immediately, before anything is done, they have to make sure those cells remain viable. How? Cryopreservation. And the point of cryopreservation, preservation, obviously, is to maintain the proliferation and livelihood of these cells before too much time has passed. Now, what's interesting about M-cell is, and of course, um, okay, is because what's fascinating is too, right, because not only are they experts in the uh, extraction and production of fetal stem cells, testing and uh, the clinical application of fetal stem cells, they've also become experts in the cryopreservation process. They have a 98% live cell rate. How do they know this? Well, because before the injection occurs for each new patient, after this process that you're about to witness occurs and the cells are safely stored, after they're tested for viral, bacteria, proliferation, and they're stored, before they're taken out to be given into a patient, they are thawed out again and they, are, and they use a, what's called a flow cytometer and of course the naked eye to test each batch of cells to make sure they have at least 98% live cell proliferation rate before being in, uh, placed into a needle and before being placed into a human being. And what's interesting about that is, um, okay, 98% of each cells uh, you know, li uh, are live cells in each of their stem cell perforations. And what you're seeing is a cryopreservation room. So this program is very unique. And by the way, what you're seeing in the background is various types of uh, organ-specific cells stored in liquid nitrogen in these um, containers. This program is unique because if you look through the other publications for all other stem cell labs, labs on earth, they only have about a 70 to 80% live cell rate. You can look this up yourself. M cell has a 98% live proliferation rate. So they have a proprietary way that is light years of, uh, beyond the average sort of stem cell lab, if you would, uh, to make sure these things remain viable. And as she states, so we're really very proud of it. Stage two, bacterial, microbacterial uh, detection. This is a back to alert 3D mic microbac uh, microbiology detection system. This is nothing unique. It's not proprietary to M-cell. Every uh, major biotech lab on earth uses this to, tech, to detect bacteria in the, mi in the microbiology. This is an FDA approved device. And by the way, here's a close up of the different stem cell types being tested for any bacterial infections. They don't just test this once for bacteria. They test it three times. They don't want to take any chances of missing anything. They do the same test three times in a row because the last thing they want is just one patient being infected by bacteria, which has never happened in the 30 years of their existence. After bacteria, so we have stage one extraction, stage two, check for bacteria three times. Stage three, everybody's familiar with PCR at this stage, PCR viral infection detection screening. They test for all viruses. Uh, obviously, everything's computerized, like everything nowadays. They did a bunch of tests right in front of me. And right in front of me, while filming this, one of the pieces of fetal material had hepatitis infection. And they said, oh, we got to throw this away. This is useless. Hepatitis infection. My next question, obviously, was, okay, how many fetuses do you throw away? Uh, well, about 10% of the fetus says we cannot use, whether they're filled with bacteria, whether they're filled with viruses, or, as we'll get to in a minute, if, even if they're clean, 
um, and they're not viable, they'll throw them away anyway. Why? Because there is an overabundance of fetuses to choose from. This is not a shortage. Uh, this is not a scarce item. This is them again, simply observing the PCR testing. Stage four, this is where like kind of the magic starts to occur. And I go into this in great depth in the documentary. They test for viability. They really just wanna come out with flying colors with bacteria and viruses first so they can get to this stage. They test with the naked eye, they observe, and also with something called a flow cytometer to make sure that each of the entire categories of cells on that list I showed you all have high viability and proliferative potential. Now this next part may seem confusing, but I'm gonna do my best. So, this is the flow cytometer. This is the naked eye, obviously. If you look at the microscope, there's a bunch of little Petri dishes that they're observing. There's different cell types in each one. What they are doing is they are taking one cell of each organ-specific cell type, putting it in a Petri dish, and seeing if it grows and creates a colony of cells. They do not believe in doing this before injecting into a person. No, no. They believe in doing this only to test them. And I'll, you'll find out in a minute why they do not believe in cultivating them before injecting. Once they cultivate them and they know they're working, they know they behave properly, they throw them into the garbage because they've already been wasted uh, in vitro. This is simply another part of the flow cytometer, testing for energy and mitochondrial potential. And it also is a way of sorting the cells. Again, same thing. This is just a, a computerized software that's hooked up to the flow cytometer. So what you're seeing on the right um, is a group of cardiac cells, fetal heart cells. Now, on that screen, this began with one fetal heart cell, one fetal heart cell, and they sat it there and let it go for weeks or more than a month, and they allowed it to naturally create that. And the reason they wanted to see that happen is because they wanted to make sure that behaves in the human body after injection. Of course, they don't inject you with one cell. They probably do inject you with something around this many cells. But the important point is they do not inject you with pre-cultivated cells because if they've already been cultivated, they've already exhausted their proliferative potential. They want this, what's on screen, they want to happen after it's injected inside of your body. And by the way, I have time lapse of all of this in the documentary. This is fascinating. This is a single fetal cardiomyocyte, heart cell. I watched this, and it's in the documentary, beat in real time. This is one heart cell beating on screen in real time. And then it's an interesting fact as a side note. We think that our heart is one big heart muscle, like our bicep or our glute. It's not. It's a series of heart cells beating in unison. And the proof is right in the movie. I mean, you just look it up. But I just found that to be an interesting side, uh, side fact. So here's a single cardiomyocyte they dropped into a Petri dish to see if it would build a colony of itself. And there it is. And what you see in the documentary is this group, this colony created from one cell beating in unison. It's a quite magnificent spectacle of mother nature to watch under a microscope. This is also extremely important. I realize uh, this is a big lecture. It's quarter till one already. So I'm gonna go a little quicker. This is what's called an endothelial cell. This is the source of our uh, capillaries and our blood vessels. Uh, these are capable of building new capillaries and, ex and strengthening our existing blood vessels. Now, this is not only important for every day. Why? Because we need a good cardiovascular system, right? We need good circulation. If someone with type 2 diabetes has bad neuropathy, bad circulation, that's very bad, right? This is very good for those kinds of things. And of course, just getting your um, circulatory system in good shape. But what's really important about this cell type is that the it is given early on in the therapy because they want to make sure your circulatory system is in maximum capacity. Because if you don't have a good circulatory system where your blood is not flowing everywhere it needs to go, then the cells they inject into you can also not go everywhere it needs to go. That's jumping ahead. But looking at this, you're looking at individual endothelial fetal cells under a microscope, in vitro, no blood, just the cells. After enough time letting them do their thing, this starts to happen. They start building their own newly formed vascular system right, on the, right in the Petri dish, right in, under the microscope. It takes a little time. It doesn't happen in five minutes, but this is a, done with a time lapse. With the exception of blood running through these veins, you're looking at in vitro a newly formed vascular system by fetal endothelial cells. And what you're seeing 
what you saw, what you're going to see in the movie and what you're seeing on the screen is precisely what these cells do to your vascular system after injected into your body. So just imagine, just this, this is just one of the two dozen stem cell types injected into you. If you're a, say, type 2 diabetic, like, by the way, my father, 80 years old, he, I took him in 2018. He could barely feel his feet from type 2 diabetes. He uh, was at risk, frankly, of amputation of his feet. And just these cells alone, even though he received the kitchen sink, as it were, all 24 cell types, you know, two dozen cell types, they blasted him with these. And within two weeks, his feet looked like a baby's bottom. They functioned perfectly. All feeling returned completely. So, but that's just one, uh, you know, case study. The endothelial cells are incredibly important, and you're going to see this again in the course of the therapy itself. Um, here they are explaining again that I tried to explain earlier. They do not believe in cultivating the fetal stem cells for human use. However, they will cultivate them in the lab to make sure they behave properly before injection. But if you cultivate them in a lab and then stick them in a needle, you've already wasted their potential. And what's interesting about this, and the reason I bring this up, is I'm sure some of you watching this know somebody, or you have, had stem cell therapy. And the people that gave you the stem cell therapy, they bragged to you and said, hey, you're going to get a half a billion stem cells. And you go to your friends and say, hey, I got a half a billion stem cells injected into me. Well, unfortunately, those half a billion stem cells have just been pre-proliferated and essentially exhausted in the lab before injected into you. I'm sorry to say it's a bit of a marketing uh, tool, and, but it's also not their fault. It's not the stem cell clinics, by and large, fault. This is all they have to work with. That, you know, when they take your adult cells out of your fat or your bone marrow, they have no choice but to throw them in a Petri dish and grow them into a half a billion cells and give them to you. But I'm, what I'm trying to explain to you is, with the power of fetal, they don't need to do that. Again, because there's more fetuses than they know what to do with, first of all. And second of all, they understand that if you cultivate them in a Petri dish and let them go bananas and grow into big families and then give it to a person, you just wasted them. You want what happens in the Petri dish, you want to happen in the person. So as she's explaining, we check out, all we do is we just check out how they replicate in vitro. So then we can be sure that it will be replicating in the organism of our patient. And that way we don't waste it, as just as I tried to explain. And what's also interesting about this is if you don't waste it by pre-proliferating them, these cells, fetal, aside from having nearly two dozen different organ-specific cell types, unlike everything else, which is just one cell type, the proliferation potential after injection is a hundred times higher than what you're talking about, autological, which is basically your own cells, which is essentially adult or mesenchymal cells. Even if it's from an umbilical cord, all it is is a mesenchymal cell. And they're also being pre-proliferated before injected into a person. Not only is fetal way more powerful because you have two dozen different organ-specific cells while everybody else does not, but they also, after injection, they replicate 100 times higher than everything else on Earth. Now, I'm going to do this again, and I apologize if this seems obnoxious. Transportation types as a metaphor for stem cell types. Again, because a lot of people have not taken the time to understand there are different stem cell types out there. Just like people do understand there are different transportation types out there. And if you just bear with me and excuse the obnoxiousness of this, um, just I'm going to continue. We have a unicycle, we have a bicycle, and we have an airplane, right? Just remember those. Here is the four basic stem cell types that modern science can give us, essentially. And number one, number three, and number four are the ones that are widely, more, more widely available. Number three is the one that's basically everywhere. Embryonic, I'm gonna go over this a couple of times. All embryonic is, is an embryo. It's when a scientist takes a frozen sperm and a frozen egg and they throw it into a Petri dish and they allow an embryo to grow in a lab. And then after four or five days, they pull it out and they stick it into a syringe and they stick it into people. Now there's a big problem with this. Now it sounds exciting by the way, embryonic. Wow, you know, it's, this cell can just become just about anything. It's such a young cell, true. But you know what else it can become? A tumor. It can become a tumor. It can become anything. It can become teeth. It can become a hair, nails. I know how crazy that sounds, but this is real. Embryonic is a very, very dangerous uh, form of stem cell therapy, and it's so immature 
There's no organs formed. It can become just about anything after a human injection. This is not something you want to go anywhere near. And the peer-reviewed literature is filled with this reality. And there are clinics in Mexico and other parts of the world that boast about this. We've been talking about fetal, and I'm going to continue talking about fetal. Fetal is organ-specific tissue. Embryonic is not. Fetal, two dozen different organ-specific cells. Embryonic, one blank slate cell that can become anything. Which one do you want? Mesenchymal. This is something that everybody has. Everybody can get, you know, whether you go to Miami, Florida, or even Tijuana, Mexico, or New York City, or Los Angeles, or London, doesn't matter. If you, any stem cell clinic you Google is going to give you mesenchymal. Now, you might say, oh, what about that guy Dr. Reardon in Panama, Eric? Isn't that guy doing umbilical? Yes, he is. He's doing umbilical. It's a nine-month-old mesenchymal cell. The only difference is umbilical is a nine-month-old mesenchymal, and if you're a 65-year-old person and they want to use your mesenchymal cells, it's either 65-year-old mesenchymal or nine-month-old mesenchymal. But guess what's in common with both of them? They're not organ-specific. They cannot become an organ-specific cell. I have to drill this home, okay? Induced pluripotent. Did not want to even include this, but this, I get this question inevitably. What an induced pluripotent stem cell is, is taking stem cell type number three, reverse programming it to behave like stem cell type number one. So you take a 65-year-old, let's just say the adult is 65, stem cell, they stick it in the lab and they somehow reverse engineer it to become an embryonic. For first of all, you have to scratch your head and go, how can a 65-year-old stem cell become a four to five-day-old blastus? I mean, have, that's kind of science fiction in and of itself, but aside the point, you're basically taking what is essentially a safe, not very effective, but safe mesenchymal cell and making it dangerous to behave like an embryonic. Eh. So what I'm trying to explain is stem cell type one, three, and four, while one and four are dangerous, three is kind of okay, number two, is basically you know the spaceship compared to the rest when it comes to transportation metaphors okay i'm going to show this again the only stem cell type in this list can give you that is fetal that's it let's do it one more time embryonic harvested from in vitro fertilized blastocyst four to five day old blank slate cell fetal harvested from seven to eleven week old donated fetus from a regular everyday abortion mesenchymal there's many sources for this. It is from you as an adult. They take it from your fat or your bone marrow, and they process it. They proliferate into a lab and make a half a billion of them and give it back to you. Or they can take it from an umbilical cord, which is a nine-month-old cell. Same cell, just nine months old. And all other forms they can get it from. Induced pluripotent, I hope I made this clear. This is a just, I mean, it's fancy. It's, it's quite admirable if somebody was able to actually reverse engineer an adult stem cell that's decades old and make it behave like a four to five day old embryo, that's great. But it really doesn't change the fact that you just created something very, very dangerous. Look at it again, folks. Sorry for showing it again. Um, I'm only showing it again because it's, in my 10 years, this part seems to have difficulty penetrating uh, sort of our psyche. Everybody gets all these cells. Embryonic stem cells, one more time, they're derived from a four to five day old blastocyst after in vitro fertilization. There are no organs or organ specific cells. If you have an organ problem, like a kidney problem or a pancreas problem or a brain problem or a heart problem, your embryonic stem cell is not gonna help you. Why? Because there's no organ specific cells. And, but hey, it's very exciting, right? Embryonic stem cells have a unique ability to develop into any type of cell in the body. They could become a heart cell, Eric. They could become a brain cell, Eric. Yeah, but you know what else they could become? A tumor. You don't, you don't want that. And if you don't believe me, look it up. This is all over the literature. Nature research, here's just one of uh, countless. The ability of embryonic stem cells to form non-cancerous tumors called teratomas is one of their defining traits. And if you read beyond the highlighted sentence, it is also a frightening one, particularly if, for those who want to develop therapies from these cells. Fetal stem cells, as I will continue to teach you, are the most powerful form of stem cell therapy to date. There are no other stem cell type on earth that can compete with them. Why? Because there is no other stem cell type available that contain organ-specific stem cells. What are we made of? Multiple organs. We're also made up of bone marrow and blood. Fetal stem cells contain all of the building blocks of our body. If you wanted a stem cell therapy to address any of these issues or for longevity and anti-aging, just scratch your head and ask yourself, which one do you want to use for any of these purposes? You want the one that contains all of this. Adult mesenchymal, it's the age of the adult. 
No organ specific cells, umbilical, nine months old. No organ specific cells, umbilical, adult, they're both mesenchymal, fetal, seven to 11 week. They are organ specific cells, tissue specific. Mesenchymal cells, let's talk about them for a minute, okay? That's what everybody has, everybody's selling it on every street corner. Now, don't believe me, let's look at the literature. Now, you've heard lots of stories about mesenchymal cells. Tony Robbins hurt his shoulder. He went to Panama. His shoulder feels great. Mel Gibson was on Joe Rogan. He and his dad took him, they went to Panama and got mesenchymal cells from an umbilical cord. All their joints feel great. Yeah, all other joints feel great. Every basketball star, football star, and sports athlete that has received mesenchymal cells generally does really well. Why? Because all mesenchymal cells can differentiate into is bone, cartilage, muscle, fat cells, if you want some more of those, and connective tissue. Do you see organ-specific cells in here? No, you do not, because mesenchymal stem cells cannot become an organ-specific cell. Why would you want to sell a stem cell type that you hope would become an organ cell when you can already get the stem cell that has the organ cell already? Embryonic cells are basically the clumsy unicycle, folks. Why would you want to drive this thing from New York City to Los Angeles? You'll be lucky to make it there alive, okay? <laughs> this is the transportation metaphor for stem cell types. Embryonic, in my Eric Marola's world, metaphorically is the unicycle of transportation, if you want to compare stem cell types to transportation. While mesenchymal from the adult or umbilical from the uh, umbilical cord are just a couple of bicycles. While fetal is the 7-11 week old organ specific cell, which is your airplane. And again, going back to the transportation metaphor, yeah, you say, Eric, well, I can ride a bicycle from New York City to Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, sure you can. Can you ride a bicycle from New York City to London? You could probably strap a bunch of floaters on it, and if you don't get eaten by sharks or die of starvation, you might make it. But you want the airplane. And if you have an organ-specific problem, you want fetal. If you want to regenerate your organ systems for either a disease, a degenerative disease, you want fetal. If you want to live longer and uh, seek a fetal stem cell therapy for longevity reasons that goes beyond your elbows, ankles, and knees, fetal is what you're looking for. I'm going to say this again. Every country in blue on planet Earth is where fetal stem cells are not only illegal but unavailable. There's one country in the middle of it all where you can get it, Ukraine. And I know, it's, you know what's going on, and we're going to address that as well in this lecture. It's this country. That's it. I encourage you to find another country, uh, find another clinic. And for any other reason to not have egg in my face and to embarrass myself, not only for two documentaries, but this lecture, I made darn sure I was right. I really would love to be proven wrong on this one. Here's another great one. You might say to yourself, okay, Eric, this is fabulous. I cannot believe I just heard about this until now. We well, wanna know why? Because only 25,000 people in human history have ever received this therapy. In 30 years of this therapy being around, how many billions, 8 billion people on planet Earth? In 30 years, 25,000 people in human history have received it, and I'm one of them. I've received it also eight times, once a year for the last eight years. My dad, my wife, my whole family, you know, are a decent percentage of this 25,000 people, and a lot of people in the documentary if you end up watching it. Now, in the fine print, I explain how I came up with this number. Estimation based on, the, on all fetal stem cell therapy provided by M-cell plus a group called Stem Cell of America who stole fetal stem cell from M-cell in the 1990s and treated people in Mexico before running out of their stolen batch of stem cells in 2015, plus competing Ukrainian clinics who once existed that no longer do, plus all fetal-derived stem cells used in clinical trials worldwide found on clinicaltrials.gov. Trials I'll go backwards into the sentence. So I wanted to include anything and everything that was fetal related stem cell in this 25,000, okay? So any clinicaltrials.gov trial you find that says they're using fetal, they are using a tiny sample from a 21 year old or 20-ish year old sample that's been sitting in cryopreservation for decades. They take it out of cryopreservation, they grow it into a big colony and they call it fetal and they use it in clinical trials. Are they using all two dozen organ specific cells? No, no, no. In the case of neurological diseases, they're just using one little brain cell that's been sitting in prior preservation for 20 years. But it's technically fetal stem cells, isn't it? That's why I included it. Now, the stem cell of America is a whole other subject. I covered this in The God Cells, the first documentary. This, is a, this deserves a documentary in and of itself, but in the 1990s, when those two scientists you saw earlier were basically working out of a one-room hospital in a Kiev state hospital, 
um, they were only using liver and brain. And this guy, clever doctor slash con man, convinced, you know, basically stole it from them and opened up his own clinic in Mexico and was selling stolen cells until he ran out. And I know this. Why? Because I was following this guy and this company from t all through 2014, all through 2015, and then 2016, and I witnessed the whole thing happen. This is a whole other thing. I also have a bunch of uh, podcasts. Find the God Sells podcast, episode 10. I explain this whole episode. 25,000 people in human history have ever received fetal stem cells. That's kind of why you've never heard of it. And that's kind of why your local stem cell expert doesn't know anything about it. Let's take this into percentages. This is the percentage of the human race that has received this therapy. This is why you've never heard of it. This is why experts don't know about it. And I'm going to prove the point even further. Cover of Time Magazine, Dr. James Thompson, the man who brought you stem cells, August 2001. Now, for clarity, this guy didn't just bring us stem cells. He was the first person to introduce the embryonic stem cell, which later found out to be dangerous, as explained. But who am I if I'm going to do my job properly as a journalist covering this, right? I've got to contact Dr. James Thompson. After all, he's the guy in Clever of Time Magazine. He's the man that brought us stem cells. I emailed him. I said, hey, Dr. Thompson, I'm working on a documentary about fetal stem cell therapy. I'm looking to get an expert opinion on this issue. It's been really hard finding an expert. Here was his reply, which I give him a lot of credit for. Eric, I'm sorry, but this is outside of my area of expertise. Boom, James Thompson. The man who brought us stem cells, cover of Time magazine, fetal stem cells, is outside of his area of expertise. Not much unlike the horse and carriage expert and the combustion engine automobile, that automobile is outside of the area of expertise of the horse and carriage expert. And one of the lead scientists continued this. This is in the movie. So she, these people go to a lot of conferences, um, stem cell conferences. And these conferences are usually closed door meetings. These are some of the world leaders and they internally share their research with the other scientists. These are generally not open to the public. So she goes to a lot of these conferences and on each conference, She's told after, the, after her presentation, the other stem cell scientists that have the courage to do so, they sheepishly walk up to her and basically tell her that she's a lucky one because she has the opportunity to work with them. Now, you might be asking, okay, Eric, all very exciting. You're, this is Ukraine. How the hell are we going to get to Ukraine? There's a war going on. Well, this is Diana on the left with her daughter Sophia on the right. This is us in September of 2022, less than a year into the war before the air, um, you know, the protection of the air and missiles was really fully instated. I went three times during the war, and I'm going again this August. My third time last December was with my 80-year-old father for his 80th birthday. We went right into Ukraine, got the therapy, and left without a scratch. This is Diana and her daughter. They both have been receiving fetal stem cell therapy for years. Diana on the left has been getting it for a lot of immunological problems. And these problems weren't something Diana was born with. This is something that came on later due to heavy-duty stress related to her daughter's diagnosis. Her daughter, at age four, here she is at age 14, I believe. At age four, she was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, which is a devastating terminal illness based on a genetic mutation. Kids that are diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, by the time they are Sophia's age, on the right there, are usually, if alive, are in a wheelchair, living off of feeding tube and respirator because muscular dystrophy is a genetic mutation that slowly wastes the muscles year after year after year. So Sophia is now 16. I'll show you more photographs of her. She started getting this at age four, and she's had it every single year to keep her muscular dystrophy not only at bay, but reversed. And the mother, watching her daughter get this therapy annually, said, I'm going to get this as well, which is frankly the same reason I decided to get it after watching enough people get it as well. So here they are, mother and daughter, traveling into a so-called war-torn country by train from Warsaw to Kiev. I'm on the train as well. I'm holding the camera uh, to get, for both of them to get therapy. This is Sophia at age four in 2012, just a few months before her parents had the courage to roll the dice on fetal stem cells. She was diagnosed, this video is in the movie, uh, this is a, a phone video taken when she's in the, they're in a grocery store and they were videotaping her having trouble walking. And they didn't know what was wrong with her. They just said, oh my God, like, why is she walking so weird? Like, why can't she walk straight? So I have, was able to get access to the earliest document of her showing the signs of this. So shortly after this video, 
pediatric neurologist realized and diagnosed her after a battery of tests and they disclosed to her parents that you, your child has muscular dystrophy and this is what you have ahead of you. Uh, by the time she's a teenager, you're gonna, she's gonna be in a wheelchair living off a feeding tube, you know, respirator, you're gonna have to turn her over at night every three hours, like not a fun existence. Um, and they were also told, the parents were also told, whatever you do, do not bother trying for anything else. We've looked, there's nothing else on earth that will reverse mus muscular dystrophy, much less slow it down. It's a waste of your money. And if you think about muscular dystrophy for a minute, Jerry Lewis raised what, a billion dollars for muscular dystrophy and did what? Bought a bunch of wheelchairs. That's it. No change has been made. Fetal stem cells has shown to stop and reverse muscular dystrophy, but because it's a genetic mutation, they have to keep going back every year to keep the degenerative process of muscular dystrophy from happening. Fetal stem cells and all stem cells, their job is to regenerate. If you have a degenerative disease, the goals of the fetal stem cells is to regenerate faster than your degenerative disease. And if you're seeking it for longevity and anti-aging, as we age, we are degenerating. And all the fetal stem cells are doing is attempting to regenerate faster than aging process allows. Here she is at 12, uh, four years old, 2012. I, I've been following her basically since this picture, 2014, six years old. The girl on the right in the white coat, forgive me, I think she has passed away since this photograph. She is the same age in this photograph as Sophia with the exact same genetic mutation and diagnosis as Sophia. What do you notice? One person, Sophia, is standing singing and the other one is in a wheelchair. At this point, Sophia has had two or three rounds of fetal stem cells starting in 2012. And I've been following her ever since, up until today. 2012, 2014 is here. Here I am in 2015 with her father. Here I am at MCL when she's 10 years old in 2018. Here she is in 13 years old in 2021, walking, standing fine. She does have a little bit of gait issues, but it's a whole heck of a lot better than wheelchair feeding tube respirator. Okay, now, the next phase of this lecture is how is this administered? Now, I could sit here and parade patient after patient after patient in front of you with all these different ailments, and I will do a little bit of that before this is over, but I showed you what's under the hood. I showed you how this material is extracted, essentially, tested, preserved, and um, tested for viability and everything. But what I have not shown you yet is how it is delivered, okay? And this is, again, a still shot from the movie, and I took a time in the movie to put up, hey, questions, ask me. There is my email. I'll show it again before this is over. The therapy is generally a two- or three-day therapy. Uh, I chose the three-day. Now, I'll say this again. Just because you choose a three-day therapy versus a two-day, or if M-Cell's doctor suggests a two-day versus a three-day, it does not mean that three days means more cells. It does not mean that two days means less cells. It just means that you're getting the same amount of cells distributed over a shorter or longer time period. And I'll get into that further. I'm entering day one. Oops, excuse me, went the wrong way. Okay, and I'm just about to get all of these cells. All of these cells. Look at this list. I'm about to get, in a personalized manner, all of these cells on this list. Not one, not two. And if I had Parkinson's, for example, I'm not just gonna get the neuronal cells, no, no, no. I'm gonna get all of these cells. This is basically an interior shot. The doors on the right are, this is like second floor, are clinic rooms. The doors on the left are diagnostic rooms. But I just wanted to show it to show you how basically sort of science fiction, almost 2001 space odyssey this building really is. On day one, the first morning you are there, like if you have a, a some kind of issue, like whether you have an immunological or neurological issue, they're gonna wanna see a lot of your local uh, medical records ahead of time. They're going to want to see all of that. They're going to, you know, and that's going to be part of their deciding factor to take you on as a new patient. They want to know if you have a disease, if they can help you, but they're not going to be satisfied only with the medical records that you provide them. They're going to also want to do their own diagnostics and their diagnostics are far more extensive than most diagnostics that are available as a, on a routine basis in the USA or Europe or Canada or Australia. So on day one, what's the first thing they're going to do? Massive blood panel, multi vials of blood, for anything and everything they can test in the blood, from my PSA to my triglycerides to my liver enzymes to blood cell counts, everything they can test for, they want to know about it. 
and that's massive blood panel. Of course, what comes next? Urine panel. They're gonna test my urine, make sure there's nothing weird going on with my prostate that might show up in the urine or anything, any host of things that could show up in the urine. That's another part of their diagnostics. Now, you might say, well, that's what they do in America or Europe or Canada, Eric. That's what they do, my local doctor does. Well, does your local doctor also do this for your annual diagnostics? Do they give you ultrasound of all of your vital organs? Like in my case, my prostate, liver, pancreas, kidneys. Do they check to see if there's inflammation or if one of the, uh, there's anything is swollen or anything weird going on? Be you know, no, not usually. You usually have to request an ultrasound. So not only do they test your blood and your urine uh, to, you know, if I haven't said so, all these diagnostics, by the way, all of these diagnostics is not just to find out your status of health, but your stem cells that they give you, this big list, you're gonna be given a personalized regimen of this list based upon the diagnostics. So let's say they find something weird in my liver or my kidney, or let's say my, something's wrong with my heart. They're gonna give me more of those specific cells than they would the next guy um, because of the diagnostics that they ran. So they check out all my abdomen, all my organs, see if they're, gonna, they're functioning okay, and if they're not, uh, you know, they're gonna change my protocol to, to address that. They also check my thyroid. When I first started this therapy, I had a little bit of a hyperactive thyroid that has since resolved since starting this therapy on a regular basis. They also do an EKG, make sure my heart's okay. And if my heart's not okay, they're gonna up the uh, cardiac cells. They, you have a nice long meeting with your doctor. Uh, not only does she explain um, you know, anything that may have come from the diagnostics, but you get a chance to also spend as much time as you need with your doctor to ask any questions or address anything that might not show up in the diagnostics. The person on the right is basically an English interpreter. While the doctors do speak and understand English, it's best to have a, a, a seasoned interpreter to make sure nothing is miscommunicated. Okay, this is important. I realize we're uh, getting up there in time. So after my diagnostics, here's my first round of injections. This is done every day in some manner. The endothelial cells, remember those blood vessel creating cells? They give this to you immediately. Not only does it, do they know it's gonna help your circulatory system, but they wanna make sure your circulatory, you know, for your own reasons, but they wanna make sure your circulatory system is in tip top shape. So the rest of the cells they're going to give you go everywhere they want them to go. So this is day one, diagnostics, endothelial cells followed by what? Hepatic and hemiopoietic. What are those? Those are the liver cells that did what? Those are the liver cells that cured bone marrow failure back in the day. They have the most experience with this. I just wanted to point this out. So what I'm receiving right there, those second and third cells are essentially, not essentially, they are the same cells that cured that guy and many other people of bone marrow failure. So if you are healthy and you're receiving this, imagine what this is going to do for your bone marrow and your blood system overall. Pre-mesenchymal cells are also used. If you remember the bicycles, they have the precursors to the bicycles. Since they have them, they're gonna give them to you. They're not as important as the rest, but might as well give them to you, right? They have them. Um, this is an important group of cells to give at the beginning, and this is done. They start with a saline drip, they add the cells to the line, and they slowly go into your circulatory system, into your vein and your arm. Again, I showed you this, because it cured that guy, those cells. Because why? Because in the f human fetuses, it is the liver rather than the bone where marrow is located. Incredible, huge powerhouse in the list of organ-specific cells. Hemiopoietic liver cells are unique. Not only can they self-renew, they are capable of giving rise to all types of cells in the blood system. I have even watched this therapy using these cells pull an AIDS patient back into HIV status. That's how powerful these things are. The developing liver, this is from the peer review literature, by the way, is made up of a mixture of cell types, including both hepatic and hemiopoietic lineages, which were what? The foundation of our bone marrow. Not only do I get these cells, every single patient that goes in the door gets these cells, but in their own personalized doses based on body weight, based on age, based on diagnostics. This small child on the bed went there for autism reasons. He, uh, he was diagnosed with autism. Uh, this child's story is in my new documentary. Next to the child is his mother, and um, the nurse is giving the, the endothelial and the liver cells out of the gate immediately right into the arm. You see how they're being uh, injected. This child was nonverbal before therapy, okay? And weeks after this therapy, the, cut, the child started talking. You can see this whole story in the documentary. I met this family before therapy. 
I filmed the therapy during, and I followed up with the family afterwards. It's all well documented. What's also interesting about the story is the mother on the right, she's a nurse anesthetist. So she's an anesthesiologist assistant, essentially. She works in hospitals. So she is a medical professional. Her husband, who was a cop, saw the God cells and said, oh my God, I'm taking my child to Ukraine. This is before the war. This is 20, about a year or so before the war, maybe. And he turned to his wife and said, we're taking our kid to Ukraine. And his wife, working in the medical profession, said, the hell we are. We're not taking our child to Ukraine. What are you, insane? And so after much back and forth and much convincing and arguing, they finally agreed to drag the child to Ukraine. And I even have her on camera in this movie, basically scared on camera before the injections began going, what, am I, what have I done? I don't know what they're injecting in my child. You know, fast forward the child speaking and this medical professional is flabbergasted and she says on camera, it's like, it's not even real. I can't believe not only did it work, but my child is speaking. My child went from learning disability to being in regular school. So again, I'm not gonna drone on about this case. You can watch this case in the movie for yourself. But the point is, is that all patients, regardless of age, regardless of diagnosis, get a personalized version of the cells I just showed you on day one. Also on day one, they want to, this is a whole body therapy, uh, if I haven't stated it so obviously. They try to treat the whole body, including the eyes. So they have an ophthalmologist on staff and they will check you, he will check you out. And all the equipment that he will check you out on is no different than your local ophthalmologist anywhere in the United States. And he uses this piece of equipment and that piece of equipment and checks you out. You know, since I'm in my early 50s and he looked at my eyes and said, Eric, you know, you're getting to that age to kind of have to worry about macular degeneration. Hey, you maybe could use the fetal eye injections. Now, before I go with this, I need to make people get very confused or they just don't listen. The fetal eye injections, if you receive them under this therapy, they will not change your vision. Meaning if you're nearsighted or farsighted and you expect to see 2020, your vision will not change in that degree. All the fetal eye injections are designed to do is to prevent age-related degeneration, such as macular degeneration, all right? So I wanna make that very clear. So it's best to, if you are getting older and you decide to get this therapy, by the way, even if you ask for it, it's up to the ophthalmologist to decide if you qualify for it, if he thinks you even need it. For example, I had it, uh, gosh, uh, several years ago once, a couple years uh, later again, and I was there with my father in December of 2023, getting the therapy for my annual therapy and his second therapy being 80 years old. And the ophthalmologist looked at me and said, Eric, your, your eyes still look great after the last two injections. You don't need another round. So I didn't have them, but I just wanted to point all this out. And he, so I'm gonna show you the injections. So here's, now here's what's also interesting about this. There's, sorry to be too graphic, but each fetus has, each person has what? Two eyes. So um, there's two eyes per fetus. So this is actually kind of a rare commodity. So each person, each patient gets one eye per eye, essentially. So the fetal eye cells are not injected into the eyeball. They are injected into the eye socket. That's the best we can do at the moment. It's the best they can do at the moment, but it flushes the eye with these very regenerative fetal eye cells to, to circulate around the eye in hopes that they penetrate the bloodstream around the eye. There might be a day where they inject into the eyeball, but we are not there yet. This is the best they have at the moment. And it's also quite safe. I mean, it just fills your eye socket filled with this fluid. You can see the uh, amount of fluid that goes into each eye. By the way, there's one needle for each eye um, into the eye socket it goes. You see, you know, a fair amount of fluid. Um, you basically, you feel like you've been crying all day, you know, for about four or five hours until it you know, um, disseminates itself um, into the eye socket. I personally have not noticed any changes in my vision. My eyes don't feel any better or worse, but... I, oh, by the way, when I went to the eye doctor not that long ago, um, he said, Eric, your eyes look fantastic for somebody your age. Your eyes look way better than the average person in their early 50s. And I, and I actually disclosed to him what I did. Of course, he sort of shook his head, nodded his head, and looked at me like I was crazy. You know? But the point is, um, maybe yes, maybe no. Are these making a difference? My eye doctor sure thinks so. Do I notice anything with my eyes? No. But do I sleep better at night knowing that I've been injected twice with fetal eye cells? Yeah, I do. Because my chances of getting macular degeneration prematurely are much lower because I've been exposed to this incredible therapy 
uh, by being injected into the eye sockets with fetal eye cells. That was all day one. Day two, kind of the same routine again. In, the, in they come, there's my interpreter, there's my doctor, there's my nurse. Same thing again on day two, the same list, endothelial, blood vessel related, capillary related cells, and the two big main factors of the fetal liver, thus the circulatory system, thus the blood system, thus the bone marrow is given to me for all the reasons I just said. Keep that circulatory system of Eric going hard, uh, not only for his own health, but also for our reasons for giving him this therapy. Now, day two also, a next group of cells. This is when they start hitting the neurological system. This is where the brain cells, the nervous system cells are injected into you. They've been doing this for 30 years. They have a different method of doing this. It's not into the bloodstream. They do it what's called subcutaneously, which is injected into the fat around the abdomen. They, after 30 years of doing this, they discovered that because of the nature of neurological cells, they are happier injected into the fat so they can more slowly absorb into the body to eventually enter the bloodstream, to eventually replicate, eventually proliferate, and eventually cross the blood-brain barrier. So that's what they're getting. They're prepping me for these injections. Here on this tray, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven syringes that are labeled and an eighth syringe that is not yet labeled. If you look at the list of cells, they are a mixture of all of these cells taken from the main list that I showed you multiple times that are in all of these syringes. And jokingly, like a ninja, <laughs> they inject you with all of these. And by the way, if I didn't mention, like, because these cells have to be taken out of cryopreservation, they have to act fast. They don't waste time. Like once it's time for your injections, there's no waiting. They wanna make sure you're done using the bathroom. They wanna make sure you're done chatting on your phone because when they come barreling through that door, these cells are in you really fast for all obvious reasons. Because the longer these cells sit uh, in, at room temperature, if you would, the less proliferative potential. So within like a very short minutes amount of time, between cryopreservation and entering your system occurs. So all of these cells addressing my neurological system are injected into my abdomen, into the fat around my abdomen, not my bloodstream. They take it upon themselves using their own behavior to exit the fat into my bloodstream and eventually make it into my nervous system and thus my brain and all aspects of my nervous system. Here they are continuing to do them, seven of them. Now, Here's what's interesting. Now you saw me getting them. Remember, I'm just going there for anti-aging and longevity. But just like I showed you the child, the autistic child that also got all those list of cells injected into his bloodstream related to the endothelial, blood vessel, and liver cells, every single patient that goes in the door, whether they have multiple sclerosis like Lawrence or me, who does not have multiple sclerosis, we get the same cells. But in Lawrence's case, not only does he get the same cells injected in the same area, but because he has multiple sclerosis, he's going to get a much higher dosage cocktail than Eric would get, that I would get. Why would I need the same multiple sclerosis level of cells that, you know, I don't have multiple sclerosis. So I'm just trying to reiterate the personalized nature of this therapy. Now, but it goes one step further. Now, Many people have done really well for many, many years with just this method. And Lawrence, for many, many years, did really well with this, just the methods that you witnessed to do really well with multiple sclerosis. And by the way, I've been following Lawrence since 2014 until today. And you'll see me interview him with his doctor. His local doctor was just completely dumbfounded. And his doctor had been his doctor for something like 30 years. And so he knew Lawrence through his youthful age until he was diagnosed having canes and then telling his doctor, I'm going to go get fetal stem cells. And his doctor thought he was crazy. And then it was doctor to witness Lawrence throw his canes away and walk around and nobody would know he had multiple sclerosis. All of this is in the movie. But the point is, Lawrence did not have this up until 2019. And so what's happening here is what's called an intrathecal spinal injection. So not only did Lawrence get all of these cells injected into the fat around his abdomen, but as a sort of a double whammy, they go one step further, and it's essentially the same as an epidural. So all of these cells are not only given in the abdomen. It's not an either or. It's not just the spine or just the abdomen. Nope. They do the abdomen as well as the spinal fluid. They want to make sure his brain is saturated with these cells to, hype, to help do what? Fight the degenerative nature 
of the degenerative disease of multiple sclerosis. And the reason Lawrence is doing so well, and the reason he keeps going back, is because he not only arrested the multiple sclerosis, he is reversing it because the fetal stem cells have the ability to regenerate faster than the disease has the ability to gene generate uh, Lawrence. And I'll get into the time period that which is ideal to have this happen because to jump ahead, if you have multiple sclerosis for 10 or 20 years and you expect to have the same results as Lawrence, you're not. Lawrence was lucky in that he had the courage to start early in his diagnosis. I'll get to that again later. But the point is here is that he was given also intrathecal of disease cells into the spine. Next patient is Bill. This is not Lawrence. Bill also got all of these cells injected into his abdomen, just like Lawrence did. And here is Bill getting the intrathecal spinal injections of all of these cells. But there's a big difference between these cell lists and what Lawrence got and what I got. Bill has Parkinson's. What is one of the leading reasons Parkinson's exists? The lack of dopamine. Fetal stem cells is the only stem cell type on Earth that is not only capable, it doesn't even have to become a dopamine progenitor cell. It already is. They already contain dopamine progenitor cells. There's no drug on earth. There's no stem cell on earth. There is nothing else on earth that has the ability to give a doctor the ability to inject dopamine progenitor cells into the spinal fluid, thus the brain of a Parkinson's patient. Just stop for a minute and think about that. So Bill is doing quite well. Bill's story is also in the documentary. Um, and I won't harp on Bill, but the point is, is that because Parkinson's is a, from a lack of dopamine, the fact that you can provide this is just, uh, for me as a journalist following this, it's just an absolute mind blower. And it's also injected right into the spinal canal, which goes right into the brain, as I said. Now, okay, so we saw Lawrence and me all getting these cells in the abdomen, right, right? And then, of course, Lawrence and Bill also get it in the spine, right? Okay, now, autism children, autistic children, they also have a neurological issue being addressed, right? But who in their right mind would give this in the spine, right? Well, before I get to that, just like me and Lawrence, just like Bill, we had this in the abdomen. Yes, this whole list of cells. The kids get it as well. The kids get it as well, right in the abdomen. And it, and it responds the same way it responds to Bill and Lawrence and myself, those neuronal cells make it through the system, make it to the brain, et cetera. But you're not going to give a kid intrathecal. If you did, you'd have to put the kid asleep, right? I mean, that's not ideal, especially for somebody having to travel to a different country to be put asleep. And frankly, to do an epi to do a intrathecal spinal injection, it's really ideal to have the patient conscious and awake. And it's hard enough to dream of giving an intrathecal spinal injection to any normal kid, um, just because on a, you know, how a, a child would react to that, much less an autistic kid. So MSL figured out a second mode of delivery. It's called intranasal. They use the same list of cells that you saw here, same list of cells you saw here, and they put them in what's called an intranasal injection. This is not a needle. This is a basically a fancy nasal spray, essentially. And they shoot these cells as a complement to the subcutaneous abdomen injections into the nasal passages to be more direct delivery into the brain. So what you're seeing here and what you're seeing with the intrathecal spinal is two deliveries of the same cells coming from two different areas of the body. Both areas and both you know, inputs have the same destination, the brain. So I'm simply showing this to you that M cell is trying their best to expand the delivery systems to make this therapy as effective as possible. And by the way, if you are a parent with an autistic child, you're not allowed to legally take the fetal stem cell nasal, you know, uh, intranasal injections home with you. First of all, they would never survive it. They never, but they do have exosomes derived from fetal stem cells that you can take home, put in your freezer to use as a complement for the month, two months, three months after therapy. It will not work on its own to help with autism, but they found it to be a really positive complement to the autism therapy overall. And um, anyway, I, autism is a big kind of holy grail for M cell. And you see the documentary, you'll see why. Most of their, uh, a lot of their, not most, but a lot of their published data is on autistic children. Um, a lot of it has to do with the developing brain. And you're giving these highly powerful regenerative 
uh, cells that are seven to 11 weeks and you're throwing them into like say a seven to 11 year old child, that mixture just, it's just, they just have a party in which, because the child is already developing. It's already fast moving and developing and generating. Um, then you com you speed that up with all of these uh, young neurological cells and other cells. So anyway, um, autism children that are young on the younger side, say 10 years or younger, do really well. Okay, again, I wanted to point out the seven syringes that everybody got. I got uh, both in the abdomen. Some people got it in the spine. The, some kids get it in the nose also. Here's the last syringe. This is only uh, designated for the male gender. And this is basically like any aging male. You know, we deal with lowering of testosterone, et cetera. This is honestly, and while I love this therapy, for any aging man, this is kind of one of my favorites because you know, your testosterone levels in, uh, increase, your libido increases. It's, it's a pretty awesome therapy. It's given into the glutes, into the basically the backside muscle. Um, but that's the last syringe you get on day two uh, under this protocol. Uh, here's something that I did not need, but I insisted on because, first of all, I was doing this documentary. And secondly, because we're living in the age of COVID, of this respiratory illness virus, um, we can argue all day about that, but that's not the point of this lecture. But people that have asthma, people that have uh, long COVID, uh, people that have lung issues in general, this is incredible uh, breakthrough. Um, this is the only device like it on Earth. And so aside from the fact that M cell is the only place on Earth that's going to provide you actual fetal lung cells, fetal endothelial, which build the vessels in the lungs, of course, hemiopoietic, which is the foundation of the whole blood system from the liver, stromal cells, et cetera. But this device they devised after many years of research and trial and error. So what's happening here is they hook it up to a machine that shoots vapor through the machine. And the syringe is all the cells on the right being slowly introduced into the vapor being pushed into my uh, lungs as I'm breathing carefully based on the nurse's instruction. So the fetal stem cells, the lung, the endothelial, et cetera, they, they cling to the vapor molecules as you're inhaling them. And as you inhale them, they coat the lungs and the fetal lung, endothelial, hemiopoietic, stromal, et cetera, coat the lungs and start regenerating from inside your lungs. But remember, you're getting all these cells into your bloodstream anyway. They're gonna make it to your lungs. This, like the intrathecal spinal, like the intranasal for kids, this is just an added bonus for people with severe lung issues. To be honest, I didn't feel any different. My lungs are honestly going quite well anyway. But when I found out about this, I said, give it to me. <laughs> um, because, you know, uh, I want, for anything, just to document it. And frankly, you know, um, yeah, I grew up with smokers, frankly, and whatever I wanted and living with COVID, like what if I got COVID later? Maybe this would protect me from that. Regardless, you know, here is that. So this is the only device like it on earth. They have a handful of these. What they did was they worked with some engineers and they created it in 3D on a computer and computer software with proper engineers, the trial and error, trial and error. And they, until they figured it out, this device is printed and all the inner parts are printed on a 3D printer. Um, you, this is not manufactured in China with a, you know, this is, printed locally, device after device, individually on a 3D printer. It's made up of multiple parts on the inside. Okay, day three, my final day. Now we finish off the list of the cells that I showed you. I'll stop and let you take a look at this for a minute. All of these are gonna be given to me subcutaneously. Notice how they once again give me again, in the bottom left, endothelial cells. They wanna keep my circulatory system, excuse me, kicking ass. The hemiopoietic cells and hepatic cells from the liver, they know how powerful it is. I hope you understand how powerful that is at this point. It did, after all, cure radiation-induced bone marrow failure. They give it to me again on the third day. Cardiac cells, heart cells, injected subcutaneously. Connective tissue cells, which again, going back to the mesenchymal, if I have some muscle issues, if I got a hurt shoulder, there we go, boom, connective tissue is gonna help that out. And by the way, I had a really injured Achilles heel at one point, at like my third treatment, and I kind of insisted that they inject into the heel. I, I mean, I really messed up this heel, and I was hobbling around, and my heel was all swollen. They're like, Eric, your heel is so swollen, like, we are not going to inject in that inflamed heel. Like, Eric, just trust us. Like, come on, what are you, crazy? Like, you did the documentary on this. Don't you understand? Don't you remember? Like, we'll just inject this to you, lo you know, not locally, and it'll make its way to your ankle, and you'll be fine in a couple of weeks. And you know what? They were exactly right. 
They were exactly right. Like I was a big crybaby insisting on local injections into my heel for my Achilles heel. And the doctors just had to talk me off the ledge and say, dude, just, just, just let them do their job. Remember, you have a blood system thanks to the endothelial cells and the hemopoietic cells. And these connective tissue cells will make it from your bloodstream down to your heel. Just give it time. And it did. It happened. My, I was walking perfectly in two weeks or less. Okay, excuse me for that tangent. Kidney cells, prefibroblast cells, et cetera, et cetera. And more neuronal cells and more pre-bicycle cells on the upper left there. Again, subcutaneous. These are all given subcutaneously, as you saw earlier. Now, I'm going to point out something here. Notice the fourth cell down, cardiac, okay? Now, I have a healthy heart, right? But they're, they gave it to me in this list. Now, I'm going to single this out for a minute. This is very interesting. This is something very fun that I witnessed. This guy is the first American ever to receive an intracoronary fetal heart cardiac cell transplant. And I filmed the whole thing. This guy was on a heart transplant list. You know what? I realize how much little time we have. I'm going to go quickly. This went successfully. Um, I'm going to show okay, Basically, this, these per, this doctor is not M-cell doctor. M-cell teams up with cardiologists to perform this because this is a very routine um, uh, modality. I mean, this is no different than doing your uh, stint in the heart, no different than a, an intracoronary, except the difference is, see that vial laying there? There's three of those filled with the cardiac stem cells, endothelial cells, hemiopoietic, and growth factors shot right into the guy's heart, right into the guy's heart. This guy was suffering from congestive heart failure. I'll get back to the story later, but we, I want to make sure I finish this uh, slideshow. This is fascinating. He's the only American ever had this done. But imagine what this will do to the heart surgery business. Just, just think about this for a minute, okay? All right, so there's that list again. Now, in this list also, I talked about my Achilles heel. Okay, in this list also is premesenchymal connective tissue and growth factors, okay? Um, in the list that went into my subcutaneous uh, abdomen fat, right? Right? Now, they do do local injections if needed. Now, this guy is an extreme athlete that I met. He's an American. This is guy's name is Matt, and he not only got everything else like everybody else does. Hold on, I'm going to go. Not only did he get, okay, hold on, I'm sorry. Sorry for going so fast ahead. Not only did he get everything that you saw, they also gave him injections in both shoulders, both knees, ankles, elbows, everything, because he's an extreme athlete. He's broken so many bones because he's bro also broken so many world records. So here he is getting shoulder injections. And by the way, the reason he got this therapy was because he wanted it before he was about to, he was either rowing a boat across the Atlantic Ocean or, or climbing every Mount Everest and its equivalent on Earth. This guy flew like an airplane around the world in a Cessna four times or something. I mean, this guy is one of those daredevil record breakers. Um, but, he, you know, anyway, so he just decided to prep himself before going on one of these crazy journeys. So this is him getting uh, shoulder injections, knee injections, both knees, both ankles, and here is him climbing some mount somewhere of him filming himself by himself on his GoPro. But yeah, this was what I was looking for earlier. He got the same cells as I did in the same locations as I did. The only difference being they blasted his joints to make sure that his joints were going to be in tip top shape for what he was about to put himself through. So, okay. So we have 20 minutes left. All right. This is essentially the list of cells that are, excuse me, the list of ailments that is, primarily treated in M cell in the Ukraine, okay? If you look at the bottom, they've actually treated 100 different types of progressive diseases. And many of M cell's patients are lifelong patients. They go back every year. And you might say, well, Eric, why does everybody have to go back every year? Well, I would say to you, okay, well, um, we do age, right? We do degenerate every year. Uh, you might ask, well, why do we have to sleep every night? Why do we have to eat three times a day? I mean, we are biological soup. Like, uh, uh, degeneration is going to keep happening. The only way to arrest that, slow that, or even reverse that is what? Get it on a regular basis. Now, if you have a degenerative disease like multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, multiple muscular dystrophy, anything in this list, essentially, one shot, one round, you might be fine. You might do great with one. And some people have. And they've never gone back. Or they go back every three years, four years, five years, either for monetary reasons or... They are just happy with that meant that often, right? But going back to the list, think about this for a minute. 25,000 people in history in the last 30 years have been treated by this therapy. 
There's 2.8 million people living with multiple sclerosis that could be helped. 10 plus million people with Parkinson's. 100,000 kids with muscular dystrophy. A half a billion people living with diabetes type 2. 9 million living with diabetes type 1. I mean, just look at this list for a minute. Let's drop down to male infertility. 7% of the world's population. <laughs> now, this is fascinating. So one thing about this therapy is it will make you really fertile. There are so many people that either A, thought they were infertile, or B, just thought they could be a little lazy about birth control that started having kids left and right after this therapy. Let's say they went for chronic pain or they went for diabetes or just went for anti-aging, and all of a sudden... <laughs> <laughs> the the female partner spouse is just getting pregnant over and over again. And if you li listen to God Cells episode two, that guy, I think he had three children <laughs> since the therapy. I mean, it, unplanned, okay? But not only that, they have cured male infertility. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, anyway, so that's why you look at this list and mainly just to sh not only show what they can treat, but if the world knew about this, think about how much how helpful this could be to so many people, not to mention the anti-aging side of this, the longevity side that I'm participating in. Okay, I gotta keep moving here. Okay, the reason I show this slide is because these are all degenerative diseases. These people were either lucky enough or smart enough to start this therapy within this time frame, and they had the best results. They're not gonna have the same, the people that have had these diseases for 10 years are not gonna have the same results. I'm gonna move quickly, I apologize, but it's, you're talking about fighting degeneration. If you find out about this therapy 10, 20 years after your diagnosis for Parkinson's or MS or whatever, you're not gonna see the same results as people like this. All these people were in my documentary. Okay, this is what I wanna make sure I had time for. This is a standalone video you can find on YouTube. It's also in the documentary. I'm gonna talk about the anti-aging side of this. I've been talking a lot about the disease side, but here's the anti-aging side. Try to follow this. I'll try to be comprehensive as I can, okay? This is a chromosome. It's a piece of uh, DNA found in all of our cells, right? Inside the nucleus of all of our cells. Inside, the, excuse me, at the end of each chromosome are what? Telomeres, telomeres. After each cell divides, more times the cell divides, the telomeres grow smaller, grow weaker, until there's no more telomeres, and the cell dies. Now, also contained in the cell is something called telomerase. Telomerase is something that helps synthesize and, and support the growth and the strength of our telomeres. I'll quickly use an example. Like our cell keeps dividing, right? And so as it divides, this, you know, the telomeres become shorter. Like, uh, an example has been used where you take a Xerox copy of a document, you take a Xerox copy of the Xerox copy, you take making Xerox copies of the Xerox copies over and over and over again. The final N Xerox copy of the multiple Xerox copy looks bad or looks degenerated because you just copy the same copy over and over again, right? It's kind of the same premise as a your cell divides over and over and over and over again until the cell dies. Telomerase helps support the prep. Okay, all right, now I'm gonna move quickly. So when I was injected with, and by the way, everything I'm gonna show you was revealed in the documentary in real time, okay? When I, when I was injected with fetal stem cells, and when all these cells, when all patients, by the way, they not only injected me with cells with long telomere length. Why are the telomeres long? Well, because they're 7 to 11 weeks old. They're basically brand new cellophane-wrapped cells, full-length, long telomeres. They not only are cells with long telomere length that are flying around my system, but they also, which are these, they also, I was also injected with these fetal stem cells that produce telomerase, the enzyme I'm talking about. So kind of double whammy happening. I'm getting full length telomere cells flying around my body in addition to cells that produce the lovely enzyme that telomeres love, telomerase. Telomerase. Now, telomerase, as I said, helps reconstruct your own cells. Now, I'm gonna try to make, I'm gonna slow down for a minute even though we're running out of time. Because I kept going back, okay, I first got my therapy in 2016, and once I realized what this had done for me, um, which is a whole other conversation of how this made me feel and how I performed and how my blood worked, everything. And then once they, I told them, I was like, look, I'm making another documentary on this. You know, I want to get this every single year. Once they realized that, they revealed to me that they were working on a clinical trial. And the purpose of the clinical trial was to do a couple of things, but the biggest goal of it was to try to prove that the fetal cells injected into not only me, but all patients 
remains in the body years later, no different than how they behave in the maternal system, no different than how the fetal cells during pregnancy remain in the mother host for decades on. And they said, huh, okay, well, using the flow fish method, using a flow cytometer, which is a whole other subject we can talk about later, we know the fetal stem cells have full-length telomeres, essentially. We know they also promote the strength and the growing of telomeres, essentially. But at the very least, we know that we're injecting these patients and Eric, and especially if Eric's going to keep doing this every year, and he's going to keep adding to the, the soup of the existing fetal stem cells that we got the year before that, year before that. And we know and we believe they're going to stay in a system and keep getting bigger and growing and more, larger families, larger families. Then maybe we can detect these full-length telomeres taking a snapshot in Eric's body and other patients' body who get this every year. Here is my, okay, my first therapy was in 2016. Before my second therapy in 2017, they measured my telomeres using the fish flow method. By the way, this is not like telomeres. This is not a test that you get for spend $100 on to measure telomeres. This is an extremely expensive in-depth test that is very difficult on the consumer basis to acquire. I was at 5.38 kilobases, which for my age was low. And anyone that knows about this um, will agree. Eric, your telomere length on average is low. Like your lifespan is not looking as good as anybody else. And to be honest with you, I was burning the candle at both ends, work-wise and otherwise. I was dealing with a lot of stress, honestly, leading up to this time period in my life. I won't get into like details, but like essentially, I can understand why my telomeres were low. I wasn't really functioning all that great. After 2017, after my second therapy, check this out. My telomeres jumped from 5.38 kilobases to 7.23 kilobases, okay? The year after that, they jumped even farther to 8.71 kilobases. Now, anyone that understands telomere length understands also that having telomeres too long is not a good thing either. Too much of anything is a bad thing, but the reason I bring that up is something interesting happened. Mind you, again, First therapy, 2016, second, 17, 18, 19. Right before this therapy in 2021, they did it again. What was fascinating is my telomeres leveled out to a nice, high, but safe range, which means my body regulated itself. Which, when they explained this to me, I was just kind of blown away, all right? So, so the telomeres just didn't keep growing and growing and growing, or is that what happened? Did my telomeres grow? Or are there so many fetal stem cells in my system that it's affecting my average telomere length. Try to wrap your head around that, okay? But I need to keep moving on this. So what does this mean? My average telomere length, whether they grew or whether I have so many fetal stem cells floating around my body that it affected the amount of the average of long telomeres, it grew by 33%. There are people charging hundreds of thousands of dollars for bogus therapies that claim to do half that. And that's just as a side note, okay. This is sort of like, okay, I'm going to keep moving. It's one thing to see the average telomere length grow, right? It's another thing to look at this. Between the baseline and when the study ended, my pool of long my cells with long telomeres was a quarter of 1%. Quarter of 1% of 100% of cells. A quarter of 1% of my cells with long telomeres. At the end of the study, it jumped from a quarter of 1% to 8.5% of my cells with long telomeres. Now, again, you have to ask yourself this question, which still is a question that has a question mark over it. Did this therapy grow my telomeres using the telomerase? And, yeah. Or do I have so many fetal stem cells flying around my system that are full-length telomeres that it affected the snapshot of my average telomere length? Just stop for a minute and digest that. It's probably a combination of the two, but more leaning towards the second one. But again, look at this. My pool of long telomeres increased by nearly 3,000%. And what is the conclusion of this? Well, quite simply, uh, while this person, this scientist who held, had this, headed the study revealed to me, uh, well, you know, it means I have more, you have more time, Eric, and it'll help you live longer, live better. And if this is not the, and this is the proof of anti-aging, she says, and if this is not the proof of anti-aging, we don't know what else more we can do, buddy. So I just wanted to point that out, and I'm sorry I moved quickly. All of this is in the movie, and this whole standalone video is online. 
But what else did this test do? What else did this do? This shows that the cells most likely, what's the most probable outcome of this? All these cells that I got that you see in this list stayed in me, they keep circulating in me, and they keep growing bigger and more families and more families. These cells stayed in me, kept circulating in me, kept growing and growing year after year. And every year I got it, it added to more, it added to more. And the family keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. All these full-length telomeres are mingling with my 50-some-year-old telomeres and joining a big, happy family and living in unison together. No DNA rejection, no nothing. Completely symbiotic as one. No different than the maternal system. These cells as well, just living with me. And again, going back to the maternal system and mimicking the system, no different than how scientists have noticed for decades that fetal cells may protect the mother, not may, they do, from disease long after the baby is born. This is what this therapy is doing, but in overdrive. Instead of just the equivalent of one pregnancy, you're talking about not only am I getting it annually, but you know, I don't, I don't even honestly know how many equivalents to each pregnancy the therapy is, but it's more than one. <laughs> Throughout the literature, cell migration from baby to mother, this is not an arguable situation. Fetus donates stem cells to heal mother's heart, reverses congenital heart defects. Baby cells can manipulate mom's body for decades. That's all this therapy is doing, but on a massive scale. That's all these scientists did was mimic what already happened in nature, harnessed it, and offering it to people. All based what originally started with this guy. And it happened from this because they were allowed to do it. These guys, we have eight minutes left on this lecture. My apologies. Ukraine's still the only country that has allowed this because those two scientists went to the Ministry of Health right there. And they uh, convinced them to green light it. And they jumped all hurdles of clinical trials and all of that stuff. And now today they went from the liver to what? Neurological cells and everything in the kitchen sink. And there's a huge team now offering this. So let's jump ahead. A lot of you might be asking, okay, Eric, okay, we get it. I want to go to Ukraine. I want to get, I want to go. There's the list again, by the way, just in case you don't remember it. Um, oh, okay, yeah, the neuronal cells, they treat neuronal diseases, right? We kind of talked about that. Ah, the cardiac cells treat heart disease. Yes, we talked about that. Renal cells and adrenal cells, ah, kidney issues. Ah, you got your pancreatic cells to treat diabetes. Some people with type 1 diabetes have gone off of insulin, by the way. You have your hemiopoietic liver cells to, base, to do what? Just put your immune, uh, immune system, your blood circulatory system, your blood system, and your bone marrow looking pretty good. Then you have your testicular cells, which cures male infertility. Real quick. Clinical trial, they only, Ukraine is very famous for fertility therapies, okay? Men and women go to Ukraine uh, because they have some of the most advanced fertility therapies on the market. So when MCEL figured out that they, cured, they could cure male infertility, their clinical trial consisted of only Ukrainians and only Ukrainian men who had failed every single possible fertility therapy known to man. And they would not accept any patient unless they could prove that they failed every single possible fertility therapy, right? Once they took these patients in, they have over a 30% full-blown cure rate for male infertility in men that failed everything else. 30% of these men can now have children. Now, that's 30% of people that were the worst cases. Imagine all the men around the world who just think they're infertile or just threw in the towel. They just gave up. They never, you know, they never, maybe they're embarrassed to get properly tested. Who knows? The testicular cells can reverse male infertility, period. Okay. Why are, again, going back to why don't, why doesn't everybody talk about this? Why is every stem cell expert not aware of this? Well, it's quite easy. The abortion issue alone is so divisive. 50% of the world agrees with abortion. 50% of the world does not agree with abortion. I'm not here to argue about do you agree or disagree. I'm not here to argue about the morality. I'm only telling you the facts on the ground here. And another fact happens to be that scientists are terrified of talking about this. This is the biggest stem cell agency in the world. It's located in California, $8 billion in funding. Are they allowed to use fetal? Hell no, they're not allowed to use fetal. They are trying to experiment with it. And the God cells, I have interviewed them. They told me off camera that they know that fetal is the most powerful, but they're not allowed to use it. Not really, not in people. Of course, their you know, mission statement is accelerating stem cell treatments to, for patients with unmet medical needs. Ah, but not fetal, can't go there. Except for a couple people, this woman was given a $5 million grant by CIRM to study human neuronal fetal cells in mice and overall human neuronal cells. They're only allowed to work in mice. They're only allowed to play in the sandbox. They're not allowed to work with people. And she was asked during her lecture, what is the source for human neuronal cells? What sources have you studied to determine which cells work better? 
This is within last year, guys. This is a $5 million sponsored American scientist sponsored by CERM who did the mouse studies. The answer to this question was, well, we've studied induced pluripotent. Remember those? Reverse engineered cells to become embryonic. They also studied embry uh, embryonic cells. And they studied what? Fetal tissue derived cells. Now, first of all, you gotta ask yourself a question. Why would they use human neuronal cells and throwing them into mice? That's a whole nother can of worms, but that's what she was doing. And of these three cell types, well, out of those, fetal tissue-derived neuronal cells works hands down the best in our hands. Why? Well, first of all, uh, they have yet to have success with their induced pluripotent cells, reprogrammed cells to become a neuronal cell, right? Why? Because they form tumors. For every reasons I mentioned to you earlier, these are dangerous cells, and she just told the whole world this. And even though they had a little bit of evidence while simultaneously forming tumors, nothing holds a candle to fetal-derived neuronal cells. People are still realizing this, but you don't hear about it. Why? Because there's only this many people that have ever had it. This many people know about it, essentially. And there's only one country on Earth that even offers it. And here I am. Here's questions. Now, I was going to get into the war a little bit because I did spend some time there uh, looking at some of the earlier footage. Uh, by the way, when you go to the polls this year, think real long and hard about who you vote for. Because if you care at all about this technology, aside from, you know, Russia essentially threatening World War III, you know, uh, you know, Germany, uh, Europe, 1930s, all reborn. But this therapy's gone if Russia gets involved uh, and takes over the country. Just, just think about that as you vote this year. Three minutes left in the lecture. Look at the map. Here's the map of Ukraine, folks. This is the size. Ukraine's the size of Texas. The blue area, not a war zone. The red area, that's a war zone. That's where the Russian troops are. See that magenta line? That is the ground transportation between Warsaw and Kiev and Kiev back to Warsaw. That is the route I took three times and will take again this August. That is the route Sophia and Diana and countless people make from the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, Japan, you name it. They land in Warsaw, take ground transportation, either train or private van, in and out of Kiev. You're in and out in a matter of days. You get the therapy, you're back home without a scratch. I've done it three times, doing it a, a fourth time. Honestly, if you could link, think about Ukraine in comparison to something like Israel right now, it's about the same danger level. You got missiles flying all over the place, right? Are any hitting the ground? No. Not, are, are any hitting the ground in Israel? Not really. Some, you might, you know, anyway, I'm not going to go down this road too deeply. But basically, I'm here to tell you that you can get this. It's not completely out of reach. This is my email. This is my website. Again, Click on any button on the left, watch my documentaries. This is the website for the documentary itself. This is my YouTube channel, 20 or more podcasts. There's Defying the Clock uh, video. There's uh, the Holy Grail of Stem Cells, which is basically the screenshot for this documentary. Um, there's 50 videos on here. I spend a lot of time helping people like you really dive into this. So if you have the time and want to learn, this is a good place to start this YouTube channel. And there might be some important, important, exciting, okay, we have one minute, important, exciting information coming around the corner. By the way, uh, moderator, moderators, you can interrupt me at any time. We're one minute away from my uh, deadline. Sign up for my mailing list, folks, because something interesting might be happening this year. I cannot tell you today. It's that big, that exciting, if it does materialize at all. So that's it. I hit the two-hour mark on the nose. Sorry, no Q&A, folks. <laughs> but email me, as I repeatedly said. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess we, all we have time for is to say thank you. <laughs> sure. And I'm sorry, I, you know, there's a lot of information covered. Just, just real quickly, did, did you mention like uh, spinal cord injuries? Ah, okay. No, I did not. I mentioned how they were testing it in mice. Now, if you are a paraplegic with this, this therapy is not going to make you jump out of your wheelchair or bed. Now, there are some people that are damaged, like when they go to get the therapy really soon after the injury, and the same goes for paralysis with stroke. If you introduce this therapy fast enough, and I'm talking like within days or weeks after a ther uh, an injury or a stroke, for example, then there, it has the best chances of results. But if you know someone who's a paraplegic from like a motorcycle accident or something, no, they're not going to be getting off the bed. I mean, yes, it does help with spinal cord injuries to some degree, but it really depends on the patient. It really depends on the severity of it. Because spinal cord injuries, you're talking about a structural damage. I mean, you're talking about a big structural issue. But the majority of the reasons people seek this are for something immunological or neurological that is degenerative, that isn't necessarily the physical spine being twisted or broken, for example. Yeah. Great. 
Yeah. Pleasure for, for all that information. I'm sure a lot of us are going to go check that out. 